Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, and uh, I want to thank Pat and Bill for uh, allowing me to come and speak with you today, or at least tonight, with uh, the state of what STEM education is all about. Uh, basically, what I'm going to be doing here tonight is giving you at least a little bit of insight of what we're doing not only at Cedarburg, but what we're doing across the uh, state of Wisconsin and then what's happening in the nation also uh, that goes with STEM. And that's okay, I can, uh, can spitball here. Uh, one of the things that um, we had talked about is uh, how we can implement or how we can kind of regenerate the, the student population uh, in the sense of what you all do as amateur or as radio club members and then as um, whatever correspondence that you use with that. Uh, as educators, we have similar ideals or aspirations to get students to be able to get involved in those things. And those are how we kind of met is that there was this uh, mutual understanding that you guys have a certain amount of uh you know aspirations to get student more students involved and we have a lot of students that have certain aspirations to move in the same direction so there's a good marriage here that we always want to be able to uh instill and try to protect uh not only yourself and your club but uh this the generation that we always will be continuing to move on with the technology and everything. And I think that's what the key ingredient is here. Um, just to go back, one of the things that uh, I'm associated with is the WTA, which is the Wisconsin Tech Ed Association. Uh, I've been with, uh, as a tech ed teacher, I've been teaching since 2000. I was in private industry prior to that. Uh, after after graduating from uh, UW Platteville with an industrial techno technology degree, I went into uh, private industry working with um, basically, uh, it was defrost control timers, but we were more of the electronics end of it. And we did a lot uh, in the company that I worked for uh, involving the circuitry and then the comp you know, making sure that the components worked out well. Uh, unfortunately, the company I did work for in uh, Two Rivers basically shut down because of some of their uh, incidentals with how they constructed things and how things were uh, at that point constructed from uh, uh, an American standpoint. So I think the big, uh, the big take on that was uh, we were definitely heavy on the sense of trying to get good product out, but we had the workforce that either wasn't available or didn't have the skill set. So uh, throughout my 11 years as being just uh, guiding through different types of industry, I, I had an industrial sales background, so I went into industrial pipe valve and fitting sales. Uh, but I also had a construction background, so that was a backup program that I had, which uh, basically I took on for about another five years after uh, I finished with the industrial sales side. Uh, but my problem was is that you know I, I was a little stubborn. I didn't want to take on many workers. I was a subcontractor for a lot of people, but yet was a sole proprietor. So uh, did a lot of damage to my body. I needed to find a place and a way to uh, be able to still deliver the message that I wanted to get out there, which was, you know, work hard, play hard, but earn a good living, and you'll be able to see the effects of that. Uh, what better place to take it than a, a high school? Um, my parents were both school teachers. My dad taught at Homestead. My mom was at Cedarburg as a consumer ed teacher. Uh, they taught me a lot about how to maintain and how to become a good working class ethical adult uh, in society. And I always kind of carried that through my messages that I've talked to with my students uh, that I currently have. I've been teaching now for basically 23 years. And part of that teaching is based, you know, is in the sense of technology and engineering and 
the, the encompassing of why we're not putting all these things as math and science and technology and engineering together. So my, the purpose, and again, when I talked with um, both Bill and, and, and uh, Pat, we were thinking, well, what would be the best message to be able to deliver here tonight? Um, and with all things considered, you know, knowing kind of where you are all working from and working with, what, what's the next step? Where are we looking to get that next radio person from, that next generation of radio people? And we sat and we talked quite a while just about <clears throat> how STEM can influence that and the different programs that we offer. And it's, it's amazing when you look across the state of Wisconsin and being the president of our association, how many areas of interest lie in the same relationship of what you guys do as what we do in education. And it, it dawned on me that, you know, we, we got stuck on this, this, this acronym, this STEM acronym, you know, science, technology, engineering, and math. And I think a lot of people get stuck on this because they think it's the next thing. It's, it's a package, just like all education. And I don't know how many of you have had to go through that, that process. Of course, everybody had to do it, but it's, it's like we always do these, the next best thing. We do this next package. We do this. And they put it out in front of you, and they basically show it off for a little bit, and then it never takes, so they go to the next thing. And then they go to the next thing. And it's like, where are we making the mistakes? And what I finally did as a kind of a teacher and um, working with the state of Wisconsin and working with a national program is I just said, forget this stuff. We got to, we got to start to initiate programming where we influence through multiple areas. We can't just stand alone anymore. We can't just do the old 200 year old educational platform. We have to be able to manipulate, collaborate and make something happen. And it, it, it's, it happened, you know, it just, what happens is you learn from the abilities and the areas that you work with. So basically what I want to do is just kind of explain uh, why if you have a strong STEM program, and again, how, what it means is how you're going to influence these kids into different pathways. And it kind of goes back to the old school methodology of, you know, the John Dewey systems that he took overseas to, you know, the, the Germanys and the Japans and things like that. Why did they become strengths and, and powerful nations? Because they use this modeling system. They use these pathways to really make students achieve what their best interest is. And I think that's where we've made the biggest mistake. So, and then basically at the end, I'll give you guys an opportunity to uh, ask questions. This might seem like, all right, what? I just don't get where he's going with this. Hopefully I can answer those questions and be able to at least give you an idea what as an educator and as a philosophy that I take to the state of Wisconsin and what most of the teachers in our state in my area are using as a platform. I think I've got control of this now. So you're, and I'm going to tell you right now, before this was all made up, I had a a pop quiz because being a good teacher, I'd give everybody a pop quiz on this um, as acronyms. But I thought, holy cow, I could be here all night if I wanted to. And I know you guys got to get home like I do because my wife's already called me three times. Um, is I'm going to cut that section out. But what I really want to do is kind of let you go through some of this information. I'm going to hit on key points and then we can actually do some discussion. So uh, really what STEM is, is an acronym, of course, and the acronym is of science, technology, engineering, and math. And basically it was Judith here that uh, coined the phrase because really it was called SMET before. It's like, what the hell, you know, SMET, it's like, oh my goodness. And Judith, you know, 
old Judy basically had the audacity to say, why are we calling it SMET? So in the two early 2000s, she basically said, why don't we call it STEM? It makes, you know, it's still the same thing. It's still the same philosophy. It's just sounds better. So she coined the phrase, and now this is basically what we use as our, 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 our trend in the way people address what we do in education and how we use that philosophy. So it, and really what it is, is just being able to bring and collaborate two or more of these areas into one. And you think, well, that's simple, isn't it? Mm, not so much. One thing with education, and probably much like a lot of the things that you're vested into, is that people take a lot of personal pride in what they do. And most everything on the ends of STEM are basically collaborating or are their individual kind of properties that are used as guidance or the lead of what education's all about. We call them silos, okay? Science, math, they live in these silos. And they've got their credentials, they've got their standards, they've got all these things, and they don't want to work away from it. If, they, if a kid that's a freshman has to take algebra, they believe that algebra is the only purpose that that kid is in school for. And it's like, holy crap, what is up with that? You know, I, I, I look at that and I'm just like, I scratch my head and I'm like, I can't, I cannot get this person to not believe algebra is the only thing that education is all about. Now, granted that because if they're teaching algebra, they should have that type of passion, kind of like I have. But the problem is, is that giving them problems two through 80 every other odd or even is not going to give them a real world experience other than the same experience, just beating them down to where they get tired of. And that's not really what we should be addressing. We should be addressing how do you use that specific product in industry and try to make it really a part of what somebody else's standard is like your product. So you sit here and you just think they're not willing to move off that. In fact, I taught at three schools. I taught at Homestead, I taught at Hartford, and then I taught at Cedarburg here. <clears throat> at Hartford, they gave us the opportunity to form a STEM bundle class as a, a and it was basically a required class. It was a science requirement, a math requirement. So of course you had to got your silos and everything, but they they kind of feathered in, kind of sprinkled over this tech ed philosophy. Well, you know, being kind of the person I am, I tried to, you know, really push the envelope and say, we can't just do science and math. We got to do something else. And granted, how do we make that work? And the whole principle of it is to be able to give the students some type of real world philosophy, some type of advantage. So when you look at this and when you try to experience this is the belief or the philosophy or the standard a school district will take on is gonna be how that message is delivered. And it's still, you know, it's like running into that wall right there sometimes with people. That administrative end, what they wanna do is what they believe. So how do you then show your beliefs as being, uh, you know, a difference maker? You got to be able to just keep hitting that wall and you got to beat yourself until you can't to give these kids that opportunity. And you tell them, look at these things that you can do with this type of situation, this type of gen you know, regenerative type thinking. You give them all these different aspects. You work with a foundation that is not typical as a textbook or, you know, or even as, you know, a PowerPoint, which, you know, all these programs, that's all they give you now. I can't believe that people will still use a textbook for years and years. And then every other year or every five years, they'll just take that textbook, buy another one for 
150, 200 dollars a piece, and just put it right on the same stack. And what did it do? All it changed was the numbers or the, you know, the that scientific notation in words. You know, so that's that's where I get caught up. And I just I look at this and I'm thinking, there's got to be a change, and we got to make changes. So a lot of this basically goes through the philosophies of how that change can happen. Oops, and probably hit that twice, there we go. So the big key here is project-based learning, PBL. It's, this is an acronym again, we get these in education. I mean, literally it's alphabet soup when you go into a building sometime. You don't even talk in real language anymore. You know, it's just you're talking in acronyms half the day. So PBL or project-based learning is what we do in our area. In technology engineering, this is where we have no struggles, but yet everyone else does. They can't figure this out. They can't understand, well, how can I take math and put it into a problem? Other than what's written in this book, I just, it's, it's, that's all it is. And it's like, no, look at what you can do. You can be able to solve that same math problem if you put it to a measurement, if you put it to a scale, if you put it to you know, a notation. And if you don't understand that part of it, look at what you do every single day. When do you ever have a, you know, a day where you have no problems? They say every human has 150 problems you know, before they even go to bed sometimes you know, during the day. How do you do it then? How do you solve those problems? So you have to be able to use this PBL or this project-based learning philosophy to get this to work a whole different level of intellect in a student. Once they get to know it, and you guys know this, you know, by everyday means too. In fact, uh, when you go out and you do setups or remote locations, what are you going to run into? You know, that is the key ingredient. And how do you solve it? You know, you don't go to, a, you know, a lot of times you don't go to a book for the answer. You're using each other and using the knowledge maybe from every one of you to bring that solution or bring that problem to a, a head and then be able to solve it from there. So we look at this as being most of what's happening in our area where we can basically go through and enlighten our student population. So where you start to look at the bottom here is we're trying to move away from this college prep thought process and try to give them more of a certification or you know, some type of career orientation. And with everything involved, there's more what they're saying. And again, there, we've got a couple slides here. You guys all know this because this is part of your philosophy too, is that most of the stuff that you're using is the technology of electronics and how that electronic moves that signal from one point to another. In today's society, there's not one of our classes that aren't using some type of electrical systems, philosophy, wavelength, whatever, to be able to educate our students. We don't use books anymore. And especially in our area, it's really not even necessary because everything's out in the web. You can dial it up. The kids have their phones on them half the time anyway. So it's like, you know, go look up in the Haynes manual to find out what, how far you have to dig down to hit your frost line, you know, and then use the math to coordinate that. And you're, you know, you've got this kid now looking at his phone in a different direction, which it's like, huh, maybe we made some sense out of it. But you can kind of see some of the other things that are involved. And I hate to say it, but that mathematics at 1%, where they think it's everything is absolutely nothing. And unfortunately, I never say that to my math teachers that I'm associated with because my dad's one of them, but I'm like, I, I don't know, dad, what, you know, 
you're a calculus guy and I know I didn't do very well in calculus, but I'm using it, you know, historically as when I'm solving problems. So, and the stuff he used to write up in his, I'd look at, it, he'd handwrite all of his tests to his students. He used to teach at UWM too. And I'm just looking at that. I'm like, I, wow, you know, what is this? Is it, you know, are you actually speaking in a, a foreign language? I don't know. So, but this is kind of where, and again, the, most of the stuff, which is really sad, is they haven't come out with a lot of new data lately, but this all kind of stems back to the value of what the Harvard studies did, how to open this up, how to create this new, you know, again, we always say new program, but it's really an old program that's just been renamed. Again, here's some just data for you. And I, this is old data. You know, you're thinking 2020, that was three years ago. Well, that's kind of what, you know, in our system, this is the numbers that we're using to refocus or to reconstitute what is the next place. So if you really look, you know, these kids and like yourselves, there is a value intrinsic type motive here to get some type of education that's problem solving or it's collaborative like what we have available. So twice as much, 26% more as, a, as an end user. And what we're really trying to do is give these kids that opportunity to gain some growth. Here's a real shock that I found right away is that there is this trend that we've got high school that are proficient and interested in STEM careers, 16% to them. Now granted, some will say, I wanna be an engineer. And they've taken the math and the science to prove and taken an ACT test to prove that they can test out really well. But when it comes to solving that problem, when it comes to realizing what's interesting in the sense of your electrical engineer, your mechanical engineer, it's the maintenance, it's the, you know, it's the ability to understand the programming, the logic, everything that's involved with that, they don't have that sense. And then their security is wiped out because they've done so well in school and their parents have helped them out so much, I'll give you one of those in a minute here, that they haven't done something on their own. They've lost that ability to retain the, you know, an, an essence of themselves. Their parents tell them to go to an engineering school. Absolutely, I'm going to an engineering school. You've done this the rest of your life. Now, granted, I'm not cutting, my sister's a doctor, my brother-in-law is a pilot, my, I've got, great people in my family. I'm a ditch digger. You know, that's the way it is. You, you get the short end, but I still have value in comparison. Who do they call when they need their pool fixed or their pump fixed, you know, for free right here, you know, that's the, you know, and they're making more money than I, you know, it's like a doctor, a pilot. Holy Christmas. It's like, can't you afford somebody that will pay for that? But the problem is, is that here, 25th in the, in the world, and we rank 17th science among industrial nations. I, I'm appalled by these numbers. I find this heartbreaking because there's absolutely no way that we're one of the richest, strongest nations in everything else, and we cannot compete in a world level with other countries that are even third world that are above us. That's appalling to me. So what do to do to make that work? Again, here's another one. This is, again, as heartbreaking as it is, um, and I think this is a good portion of what we really, you know, you've digested as adults. I've done it. I sit and I think, every damn night when I'm in bed and trying to get to sleep is that we cannot fill jobs right now because we don't have that workforce that has those abilities. And the problem is, is that I've got every 
local business coming knocking at my door trying to find a CNC mill operator, a maintenance technician. You know, uh, as simple as you know, we'll take them if they're breathing. You know, I'm like, I'm not ready to put that kid out there. That's just breathing because they are not doing very well even in these other classes, let alone my class. So I'm like, how do we get this, this message across to everybody? And I look at this and there's, it's amazing to find out what those jobs are paying and how they relate to very basic skill sets. So again, just a quick message about what we need to do and what's happening with these kids. They're, they're shying away from this stuff. They're, they're more into, and again, I'm not ripping or riffing on anything other than that they want to go into engineering. They'll go into school about, I would say 20, maybe about 19% of them drop out after the first year because they cannot handle that next level kind of thought process and what they'll be heading into. So what we need to do is figure out what's, what's good, what's going to make it work. How many people have ever heard of this, the makerspace trend here going on? Absolutely. This is the, you know, we talk STEM, the first thing they say, and this is what, you know, the, the upper echelon, the administrative role says, what we need to do is put a makerspace in. All right, well, then what does that constitute? Well, we just put, you know, a bunch of tables together. I, you know, throw some cardboard construction paper, some hot glue and doing all this and as you can see, they, you know, they've got all these different things around here, like paintbrushes and stuff like that, you know, wow, you know, that is, that's a lot of crafting is the way I see it. And granted, you know, Marie Callender, you know, all the people that are talking about trying to make things more clean. And this is a mess because normally when you get a lot of kids and you get a lot of this stuff in there, it just is like, you know, it's like a fun house. They just stuff everywhere and it's like uh, you know what what did that just teach them out of one you know that you've created go crazy the messages this is one of the greatest messages that made me actually move from hartford to cedarburg is an administrator told me i'll throw a pile of wood in the middle of the room they'll and I'm just like, what? And it's like, are you, you know, a few expletives had come out at that time. I'm, you know, I'm not shy to kind of show where, you know, the transparency of my bringing up was in the construction industry. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. What is, what is that going to prove? That they can put a nail through another piece of wood and maybe hit another and just, let it sit there. And again, we talk about, you know, how this even an art influence is coming in and making this a steam program. It's like, what did that just solve? That isn't to me a real world problem. That's making, you know, chicken salad, as my dad used to say, out of the chicken coop, you know, and what would, of course, expletive after that. So what we need to do is this is okay if this is what your philosophy is. And it's going to give them a little bit of learning skill, but it's not going much beyond like a free recess. And if you do that at a high school level, you're going to be wasting a lot of money. Because at that point, what you're doing is you're buying equipment that really isn't efficient. It's you know, we always talk about how tech eds transition through these modular units and these different things that are supposed to be real life. That doesn't work either because what you're doing is you're just playing, you're not doing. So the way I see this is this is not the end game. This is maybe a good start. If this is, you know, if you've got a place where you're just trying to get here, you know, the whole, is this a real maker space down here? And they got kids on tables with glue sticks and all that. 
I'm like, mm, not really. But if you look up in that corner up there, that's where maybe your maker space is starting to trend. That's where you have to go with it. And you start building small, go to big. Don't start off with a lot of small things and think it's a big space. It just, it doesn't work out because what happens, all this stuff starts to mothball and guess what? It sits there, it becomes an antique. Like technology, you gotta stay with it. If you don't, it's worthless. And that's usually what happens in our industry. It's that a lot of that happens. And then basically, here we go. You know, what do we have to do to make the next level understand on how to critically think and solve ill-structured problems? These are areas of interest to us as tech ed guys. This is what we're trying to get math people to do. This is what we're trying to get science people to do, is understand that you need to problem solve. You need to be able to get some type of real world application. You've got the first robotics competition, the FRC down there. Programs are excellent. They have a lot of key players in that, in those associations, Boeing, all these top end companies. These are actually using a lot of the skill sets that you guys bring in and being able to relay those signals, those devices that actually will move that. I know when we talked the last time in our group, we talked about radio frequency and RC production, uh, avionics and using you know scaled planes and things like that. A lot of this stuff is what these kids are doing. You've got certification programs in welding, in CNC, uh, they're national programs. You can implement them at the high school level as long as there is that buy-in from your, your district. So as I see it, these are some of the strategies that you have to be able to promote at that level. Same things that we've been talking about. It's all the same language, collaborative learning, you know, strategies of being able to get content to or deliver content to the students. Engage in learning less lecturing. Because right now, if you, you know, kids like myself, you know, we're all hopped up on ADHD and medicines about that. How long is that kid going to sit in that seat and just listen to somebody talk? I'm telling you, I can't, I, I usually, my, my lectures, about five minutes like this. In fact, if you fall asleep, I'm okay with that because I see it happen even when I have to give a presentation. I'm like, okay. But the problem is, is that that's math and science almost to a T. You know, yeah, they'll be able to get to work in their textbook. By that time, they're like this. And it's like they're already, you know, the textbook is ancient anyway. So what are you going to do to engage that learner in that lesson? So again, what do I have to say? Critical thinking, problem solving, leadership, ethics, responsibilities, invention, innovation, imagination, communication. Those are the key ingredients that'll make something really fly in the right direction. And the only way you can do that is with some type of scenario. And again, where do you go? You got to get the buy-in. You got to get that administrative role, the community, the, the employers all on the same page. If I can, if, you know, I go out every, you know, today I got three new um, emails, one from Carlson Tool, one from North Star, and then one from Rockwell International asking for students to be able to work on something. And then I got this one, it was a uh, local, kind of like this uh, senior center. It's got a ping pong table that's got a broken leg. Can you weld it? It's like, eh, that's not a weldable piece. We're looking more at TIG. Maybe, you know, we got to look at what we can do. So it's like, the problem is, is that there's all these people that need more. And I really have nothing to give back because of, the problems of this right here. I'm getting that way 
where I can get maybe some kids out. And we're going to discuss that in a little bit. But everybody here has to be part of the solution. And normally, we have one or two that are part of the problem. So what do we do? So uh, this got kind of, I had to switch this over to a PowerPoint. So um, it's all about the teachers. You know, you got to get the buy-in. The administrator, as long as you get that group of people in together, we can get that buy-in if we just hammer them, you know, you know, philosophy by numbers. Let's get it as many people as we can together and we'll just take them over. We'll pin them down and we'll say, you got to do this and develop that, those skill sets and give them the message. Have a good presentation ready to go. Give them the message about why it's a disciplined area and make sure that they totally understand. The lessons have to be done beforehand. It doesn't mean you have to have buy-in by your, by your employers or any of the businesses, but yet you should have a framework set up before you go. That's what we did at Hartford. Got to have something that's real world. Uh, there's all sorts of opportunities out there as a teacher to make contact. This is what I don't understand is that math and science, I don't know what they do. They're in the door at 7.15, they're out the door at 3.30. I'm like, what are you doing? You know, I, what, it's like, I'm here at, you know, I leave my house at five o'clock in the morning, get to school by 5.30, and I just left before I came to this meeting because I need to be able to figure out what the next purpose is. I can't just shut my book, close it, and go home. It's impossible for me to do that. There's more out there. There's associations. There's technology that has to be studied and learned and improved upon. If you don't do it, all you're going to do is give them the same message over and over and over again. I just think it gets, I mean, I, after I hear it, you know, three or four times, I'm, I'm already like moving on, you know, it's too much for me because I've, I've already passed that. So the point of order is to be able to give them the ability to get some type of creative real world experience. And again, it's, I might be beating that message a little too much, but that's what the problem is in education is they don't see it. They can't really understand how that is accomplished. Hands-on learning, you know, we go back, you know, you guys, probably all remember the days of, you know, allied arts and, you know, Vicka clubs and things like that. Those are where we still are trying to improve upon as our, as we go, we've all we've done is moved with technology. We're still trying to get those kids, those same different, you know, those same type of skill sets, but with a different form of technology. So, we are doing the addressing. We just need everybody else to jump in. We'll set them up. We'll give them all the help to get there. They just have to come to us. I uh, put a link there and we'll actually, um, Pat said he'll have this linked up this, I don't know if anybody's familiar with it. It's the Northeast Wisconsin Manufacturing Alliance. These guys are basically out of the, um, the valley area. These are probably, I don't even know how many businesses are associated with it, but these people have decided that if they want workers, they have to bring that work to the students. So they've developed different, even lessons for teachers. Teachers don't even have to do anything anymore. They've done it for them. It's, it's amazing stuff. They go into industry. They use what they're doing in industry. I just I just was overseeing one of them and it was with Sargento Foods and packing their yin yang um, sausage and cheese. Okay. There is a complex, basically, algorithm that they use. It's a vibrating table. It brings around all these different snacks. Packages go one way, everything on the vibrating table comes down. And what it does is it's using uh, an algorithm to be able to justify not only the number, but the weight of the container, 
and then the size of the pieces. So at all this is going on and there's this guy standing there in this, you know, all his dressed regalia, which is basically something to cover his beard, his head and a smock. And he's talking about using calculus to determine the amount of packaging to mix, to weight, to the volume. You know, if, it's a, if the volume gets too high, the shrink wrap doesn't go on it right. It's amazing to watch. And then they put it to a math question. And he sits there. So what does it take to get that to work every single time? And how much waste do you have if one package, two packages, three packages, whatever, are gone? So not only do they have to use that science and that math together, but they have to calculate waste and then product, you know, recycling. Do you recycle all that stuff? You can't. It's food. It's touched. It's gone. So now they've lost that profit margin too. So now they're getting into the business aspect of it at the same time. They've done it for them. And yet I can't get enough people even to take a sniff at this stuff. I'm like, whatever. It's, you know, your loss, I, my game. By the way, that kid right there is one of my seniors. He's working through the Youth Apprenticeship Program in uh, Sockville. Uh, basically is, again, I've got a chosen few that I'll send out into industry. That kid's like a, a you know, he's one of my aces. In every other class, he's getting about a C average, unfortunately. You know, but I'm not lying. He's got like three or four offers already from industry that can pay for anything. You know, when you're looking at an 18 year old with a CNC background, he's already been offered a couple jobs that are close to even six figures that I have never made in my lifetime. I'm like, holy shnikes, that is amazing. And you better hop on that bus pretty damn quick. So. So this is kind of the whole thing is that the best way to employ this skill set is to use some type of process. And these processes have been hem and hawed, but really any type of STEM program will give you a process to use, use it. It makes the most sense. Give people that, this is about the only educational philosophy that I try to teach in my classes other than what the machining is all about and what I teach the metals manufacturing, the autos. It's like, if you follow one of these paths, one of these processes, it will get you to an end result. If it doesn't, it's a looping process. So it'll automatically go back to where did you make the mistake? And that mistake is usually, if it's not one, maybe two steps back, it might be all the way back to the beginning. Start over. and they're you know, again, they're, they're buried with information. Kids have a problem with this because they want to just jump in. They need to make that, that, that associate kind of level of understanding. You can't just take an idea or a problem and start building because then you've now created another problem on extra money, extra material. You might have failed at it. What's your next step? Where do you go? You have nothing else to deliver because you've just started from go. You know, you're zero to 60 right away. So these are ways to be able to accomplish that. And again, these are points of interest that we usually push. Ours is the one at the top with the Project Lead the Way one. I use that through all my classes because it's, it's one of the easiest ones to define and be able to institute. All right, and then finally, how do you predict that it's a STEM type relationship? You know, you can draw, you know, you might be the best person writing, being able to write curriculum, but the problem is, is that they, if you can write curriculum, you're probably going in the wrong direction from what you have to do. Again, you look at some of these things that need to be done. Is it a real world problem, you know? You might say, oh yeah, I've, I'm putting this to this test right here. I've written a great question that, that has real world application in it. Well, it's still just a question. How do you prove it? How do you 
how do you take that process and be able to say, yes, that is? Where do you stop? Because at one point, developing the solution is just the third step. One, so do you draw it? Do you take it to a CAD system? Do you, do you have it just in your head and you're just gonna put it down and be able to construct it? Absolutely not. You're now gonna make the problem even worse. Can a student relate? Is it a local problem? Is it a national problem? Is it something that's relatable to them? Those are things that you have to be able to put in front of them. They will not do something that's your problem. You got to make it part of their problem. So these are ways that we figure out, you know, I always think that, you know, my problems are so much more hair raising than what they've got as problems. But what they have as problems is usually something pretty close. It's just in a different relationship. Does it cover important content, performance? Is there assessment? And then how do you deliver it? And this is where delivery becomes the key ingredient. Are you going to make a prototype? Are you going to present it to a, a client or a, a business leader? Those are things that we try to do as industrial arts people is make it worthwhile. So more than a cute toy. Because most of the time when they build something in like say a maker space or even in some of these, you know, these enriched STEM slash engineering programs are not anything other than a toy. It might be a prototype that looks like something, but is it really actively going to improve or relate to the product line for the end, end customer and user? So those are things that we look at as tech ed guys. So kind of just to wrap it all up here, here's a really interesting slide that I found about as much of what would be what's happening in industry or what's happening in education, but really how you can apply it. And really it's all about getting every type of student available to this, this relationship of STEM education. You know, you have to reach out, you have to grab them. Greatest thing about our school is one, you know, things that happen, Sparks and Arcs are right outside of our cafeteria. So we've got that stuff happening, full windows, all this stuff. And I'll show you a couple of pictures. We just had, within the last three years, uh, the Cedarburg community put in you know, quite a bit of money to restore, to referend our area. It was ready to die. They were going to cut it off, just like mecklen Thienesville did, just like a lot of other schools are doing or a lot of other communities. Where are you going to get your people from then? Because most of them then do what? Where do they go? In fact, I had a series of parents that when I left, pretty much hunted me down, said, why'd you go? I said, because they were sunsetting my program. They were burying me with just stuff that I didn't want to do just to be liquid. And then I was missing a good portion of the kids that they were, when they sunset a class, that were getting left to the side. You know, one of them was my nephew. And when I saw that, my nephew was, you know, my sister who's a doctor and everything had learning problems. He was dyslexic. They didn't know until they put it to it. He's a pilot now too. Drives, he basically flies, you know, as a surgical team to do transplants up in the north part of the uh, Wisconsin, back and forth, flying surgeons. I'm like, are you kidding me? They left him for dead at mecklen Thienesville because he didn't fit that mold. And unfortunately, the people that did fit that mold haven't done anything that they did or were pushing to anyway. So I was a little disappointed in something like that. It's one of the reasons why I left. But here's kind of what's happening in the United States on the top. We have these programs now. The STEM 101 is actually a program that was initiated through the state of Wisconsin. A gentleman, uh, Dr. Al Gomez, was one of the presidents, what I hold the position as. He took that philosophy and has now made a program 
to implement more real life learning. Project Lead the Way is an engineering program, national based program, basically from K to post secondary. It's a great program, pretty difficult though. I, I'm certified in probably about eight of these classes. I would say they almost put too much content in. And a lot of it is not quite to what reality is. North, uh, Northeast um, um, Manufacturing Association, I've talked about. My association, which is the WTA, where the Wisconsin Tech Ed uh, Association, which basically meets as all K through 12 and college level tech ed teachers. And we basically try to find what the next great thing is. Some of the things that are happening around the, the United States have happened in other countries is that we're developing technical academies now. They're basically funded through private industry, mostly, or other educational institutions. So Lakeview is down in, um, right next to, uh, between kind of Kenosha Racine, <clears throat> excuse me, but Gateway Technical College is one of their resources. They run a lot of their adult classes there. They run certification programs for the kids. Any student that's involved in uh, Kenosha Racine school districts can go to that school as a secondary school. And then of course, what we're doing here in Ozaki County is the Ozaki County Youth Apprenticeship Program. Uh, basically putting CTE to the forefront. Uh, we try to get as many students that are going through our classes as we possibly can to make that program really work for the students. And they have uh, several here around the, you know, Ozaki County, several students from Grafton, uh, goes all the way up to uh, Northern Ozaki High School, and then a couple other schools that, you know, still have some interest in, in trying to get their kids out. Mequon's not one of them. So I just put our mission statement. This is kind of a unique scenario. So as you look, our mission is to always, you know, create an exemplar, exemplary education institution that students can nurture an environment to develop into lifelong learners to become responsible adults and to achieve the goals and dreams, achieve their goals and dreams. That's a lot of fluff talk to my, in my point. We need to give them some type of reality check. Where, where can you take that, that type of goals and dream? Now, granted, we've done a lot to make that work better for all students. That's what I'm impressed with at this school. That's why I came back. I'm a Cedarburg uh, graduate myself. So here's just a little bit of what we've done since the school. We've created this innovation center. If you look down the hallway, uh, hard to see, of course, in a 2D picture, um, but that hallway basically separates now what is uh, tech ed on one side, art on the other side. We collaborate with art. Business is also right down our hallway here. So we try to make this what is a real world maker space where we can organize and collaborate. We have capstone classes that we bring top level kids or at least juniors and seniors to that forefront to start working as industry standards. So they'll come in everything from printing to machining and or um, industry level stuff. Uh, one of the things that we have, so this is more the, what I did is put kind of these slides together as areas. This is kind of our engineering area. So we do a lot of our prototyping. Uh, we have everything from 3D modelers. We have a robotics area way in the back here. This is really hard to see right here in this one slide. And I should get my pointer if it weren't. There it is right here. But that was uh, gifted from Velo Manufacturing, put close to $152,000 $100, into our robotics area so that we can transition kids from learning just regular machining to some type of you know, coding and or language that is going to be part of their lifestyle for probably the rest of, you know, our lives for sure, whatever the next level life is too. Uh, and then we have our 3D printers. We kind of think that 
If you do any type of 3D printing, it should be basically when you do it at like manufacturing, they're small, but we do bundle 3D printing so we can do multiple parts, multiple things, try to get, we didn't quite stack them yet, but we're looking to do stack 3D printing where you get you know, somewhere between 15 to 20 3D printers going all at once and making one part, you can do mass production that way. So as it goes for our woodworking side, we still have traditional tech ed, uh, but what we've done is we've integrated CNC processing into it. So again, we have some laser engraving, we have a, a 3D, um, and again, this is a gantry style, um, basically a large format printer, but it does everything from, you know, steels to aluminums, plastics, woods. Uh, that table is roughly about a, I think it's four by 12 inches in, or inches feet in an area. So we can create fairly large product with it. We have the Laguna that's a CNC uh, lathe basically programmed straight off of some of our software. We use uh, Autodesk Fusion, Inventor, SolidWorks. We try to give them all a little bit of a uh, taste of that. Our actual lathes there are programmable, you, uh, DRO controlled, so you can have uh, some uh, finished end type stuff with that. And then of course, we have some of the basic uh, other tooling. Uh, use SawStop for table saws, things like that. Saw stops, one of the safest table or one of the safest piece of equipment out there. It's a microchipped and electrostatic. So anything that comes into touch, even if it's moisture from your skin uh, or any type of metal, the blade, I forget it's one, two hundred thousandths of a second where it retracts, coils up, goes away. You literally don't see it. I uh, unfortunately offset one of our blades at Hartford uh, when I was measuring. Of course, uh, I'm working, trying to get this project done. So I put a tape measure probably within an inch of the blade, trying to measure up my fence because it wasn't too accurate. I'm looking down and all of a sudden everything's gone. And I'm just sitting there, I'm wondering what just happened. And here what I did is I got my blade of the tape measure too close to the blade that electrostatic sensor, pick that up right away, bam, gone, $175 later. Uh, that was kind of a dumb mistake, but uh, you know how it is. It's, it, teachers make a lot of those. Yeah, the blade, everything's gone at that point. So this is our machine shop. This is uh, one of the areas that I uh, am teaching uh, form. We uh, use Haas Mills, uh, that's part of the, uh, introductory into CNC processing. They're Haas mini mills. They basically have tables that are uh, eight by 20, I think is what I can do for a long reach. Uh, that's this area right next to it. We have a plasma cutter. So we deal with plasma science and, and CNC controls that way. Uh, we also have Haas lays over on the other side with still manual lays. Uh, we have two Haas lays and we have four manual lays. And we still have the bridge ports with the DROs on them for manual mill, uh, milling. Uh, we still want to create that sense of uh, that work ethic and trying to get the feel of how things really work underneath you on a, on a large scale. And then we actually go into a lot of the met sheet metal work and or metal bending. We have a series of manual things. We have a, uh, a planishing hammer set. We have all sorts of stuff to be able to do hand unique hand turning and, and or bending. Uh, our welding booths are way behind. I didn't take a picture of that, I left that out, but uh, that's one place where I felt we uh, fell a little short. We only have six welding booths. And again, the, um, the lathes themselves having six lathes, I'd like to have a lot more milling machines and or lathes. Of course, that just adds cost. And then finally, I can get to it here. There we go. We do have an auto shop still, uh, still a very important part uh, in technology. This one thing that we have uh, a huge concern about is that what, you know, who's gonna maintain 
all of our stuff when it comes down to this technology that's driving our industry. Um, we're really trying to get into that whole process of computer control and knowing that each one of the vehicles that are, are, that are moving today is, is basically gonna be read by either some type of hand OBD or being able to do some type of diagnostics through a computer, really just hooking a computer up to a car, being able to type in the code and being able to correct anything from that. And so we have two bays, we actually have four bays for the uh, auto shop. And then we have our small engines class two, which is a certified Briggs and Stratton class that um, is a freshman level class. So if a kid wants to get certified in Briggs and Stratton, as a freshman, what is that, 13 years old, you can have a certification at 13 years old. Um, and also some of the other things with uh, SolidWorks, um, Autodesk Fusion, we have certifications in those so that they can get certified again at 13 years old. Kid got certified in SolidWorks when he was, I think he was 16 at the time, sophomore level, applied for an ad in the uh, local paper. They, you know, they did a, a Zoom interview and the guy basically, this was back in 2019 to whatever it was, um, basically said, well, I'd give you this job because you're overqualified. Um, but since you're 16, I can't let you in my plant because you're not legal. But the actual salary for it was the starting salary for just that job, that design job, was $67,000. And he said, I'd love to give you that money because you're actually more qualified than my senior design engineer right now. Um, because he's old school, kind of like where we all came from. But I, I can't, can't let you come into my plant. You're, you're too young. So it was kind of a, but he got an internship out of it. And uh, I, I believe it all worked out for him. He's a, um, he was actually going to go to Madison, decided not to, and uh, is now their senior floor manager uh, uh, for their uh, CNC division. So making that money that they told me to make right after high school. So, so that's my presentation. Hopefully I didn't bore you too much and give you, you know, you know, thinking, why, why did we come here tonight? But uh, truly, if you have any questions or concerns, I'm, I'd love to address them, give you some of my insight. You know, again, I'm, I'm pretty, out there a lot of people say i get a little too obnoxious when i try to teach and talk so shoot whenever you're ready you know or shoot me and get me out of my misery here and yeah this is peter i have a um so all the do you require does the school require that everybody go through a stem type of course or just certain people elect these things because um, yeah not everybody is kind of STEM oriented. I mean, I mean I'm kind of a hands-on person. Mm -hmm. I, I do. I used to do some tinkering, and um, and you won't find anybody that's going to be like that everywhere. So correct. Uh, and then I have another question later on. But, sure, uh, absolutely, and that's an awesome question because this is one thing that just drives me crazy is that every educational platform is required. You need to take four years of math, you have to take four years of science, three years of social studies, and five, four years of English. You have to take a foreign language now to be able to get into college. You have to have like two or three years of that. But yet there is not one class that as a tech ed or class, or you, know, you can take your STEM, your math and your science classes as requirements, but there's not one of those classes that involve any type of real world experience. All the tech ed classes at our school and most of the schools in the state of Wisconsin are elective based. And I totally get it. It's, it's, it's a problem. Uh, we're trying to generate a working class or a new working class society that's gonna be able to drive our economy in industry standards and we can't find it. 
it's our classes. We, we actually, when we instilled our new tech ed area, have seen a growth of about 15% in our classes, but yet we still are elective base and are just a lot of times are having students pushed into those classes to fill. So I would say a majority of the students that are there are probably, again, as an elective, given it a try, why not? It's free. It's, you know, you don't know. But then uh, there might be maybe one, two percent that are actually going to use those skill sets at that next level. And that's that's a travesty. You know, when you're only teaching 120 kids, you know, one or two percent, that's not a lot to uh, be able to say. Yeah, um, well, I have a follow up to that then. Um, yeah. The skilled labor force in terms of plumbers, electricians, carpenters, is you know there's few and fewer of these people i think yep. and um absolutely so i guess some people are you, i guess your school or this program might prepare prepare them for that or yep so what we what we're trying to do and again there's so and this happens a lot in education too is if you pick something up you have to give something up it's like you know like anything you're you know, there's only so much they'll give you as availability, because if you take more, which we like to do, that means that they'll either have to supply another educator or another person to be able to administer that, that type of skill set that costs the school money. That's money that they think, you know, for educators, not worth it. You know, why don't we just cut the program? That's where I, where I get a little frustrated with most of education is that it's all about the, it's not about what is good for the student sometimes, it's what's good for the pocketbook. And that there's a huge part of that, which is budgeted every year in a different direction. So the money that we get for like, say, We've got this beautiful facility. We've got Haas mills. We've got all this equipment that's just fantastic. What's going to happen when either it breaks down or when it has to be replaced? Is there a, something that can take that? That money is not there. So now when the kids have to then, you know, if you can only do one project rather than doing four, there's a there's definitely a discrepancy, and then on your in your case, if there's a program like a, a certification or a apprenticeship or something that we could deliver for the students, what they would rather do is send them somewhere else to get that done. So what that does is it takes the student away from that area of their interest, which is their friends, their safe place, maybe the school and sends them out to another place so absolutely i think there's a huge problem with that and a lot of programs because of the expense and where they're shell putting dollars into it usually get eliminated or they call it sunsetting which is a nice term for just forgetting about and it is it's there's a huge problem we uh matc definitely wants kids to come into their program so I agree. There is, and that's one thing that I'm trying to work with right now. It's trying to get the state of Wisconsin to put some type of ethical principle behind these programs. And it's really hard. Okay, I got Hi, um, my question. Dave. Uh, we can hold it off till later, I guess. Yep. Is it now? You're doing fine. Okay. So just keep it. Oh, yeah. Am I up there? Yep. Yes, absolutely. Now it's just fine. So just keep in mind, if we ask questions in the room, we do need to have the microphone so everybody can hear you. Oh. I'll hold it. Fine. I want it. I know you. <laughs> um, for example, with the 3D printer, you train an operator. Does the, have you had any where the operator is curious 
as to how in the hell that thing really works and what the materials are and what what the programming of it is uh, so how it the engineering side the of the opera of the design of the unit itself which is the practical part it's easier to train an operator than it is to train someone to fix that machine now do you have many kids that get that curious as to want to take it apart and see what, how it works You know, and that's perfect resolve of what we're trying to get done is that, you know, and this was one of the things that as good educators, when still at Homestead at the time, working with a computer science program and stuff like that, we were trying to find the the way to institute that type of program. Now, granted, as hardware, software, things like that, there are kids out there. We, you know, what's been kind of the the way that education has kind of moved in the right direction is they've added computer science into the math program, which now can become a required elective for that student. Well, guess where these students are going to rather than their algebra class? They're going into computer science one through four or five and becoming, you know, really astute to how to program how to, you know, go through, they do even hardware scenarios, you know, is there a Cisco certification that we could pick up? Those are things that we look at as kind of those infringed programs that we could add, but yet it's, there's always a level of cost. And that, again, that's where this administration always gets bottled up. It costs what for a, a, Cisco kit, thirty thousand dollars per kit. That's a lot of money. In real life, that's pocket change, you know, for industry. But for an educational institution, that's something that they would rather slide or not fulfill. But we do have those kids, and if they do take interest in that, we have level classes like capstone, co-ops, independent studies. Uh, so absolutely okay so we like for us for my sense I mix over all my classes now granted in auto metals and to use the you know can teach the same electronics and all of them you can teach the basics but then you start to pathway into that electronic area so if it's using an OBD and then using that as a service tool to be able to run that, that coding or running the, through the relays or stuff like that, absolutely. And then what happens is they can go to robotics, they can do all these other things. You know, principles of engineering goes through a huge component of electronics. Unfortunately, that's a second level class for a project lead the way, and that can pretty much stifle kids because they, not only do they have to learn electronics, they got to learn about thermodynamics, they got to learn about physics, they got to learn about, and that program itself, we have to run through everything because it's on a test that is going to be certifiable or worth credit at the end. So can we, can we hone in? They've dumped electronics out of our, our program, unfortunately. That's, I found that, you know, I took electronics in Cedarburg when I went to school there, it hasn't been around for probably years now, unfortunately. Uh, this is Dave on Zoom. Yep. Go ahead, Dave. Um, I run a small business here in Washington County, and um, I have tried for a number of years to reach out to multiple school districts in this area to get uh, students or recent graduates to intern here. I run a technology company um, and I can't even get your counterparts to return my phone calls or emails. Do you have any advice for me? Thank you. You know, it's, uh, 
It's a great question, by the way, being a Hartford uh, former teacher, you know, I, I agree. It's one of the things, you know, actually, I think Washington counties, they're, you know, collaboratively, Slinger, Hartford, the West Bend schools, all very astute to a comprehensive learning style. You know, they're there to be able to promote that side of it. I, you know, when I was there, I was always trying to find something else. Now, the problem with it is, is again, a Hartford is a joint union school district. I'm not saying that that's a, an issue, but they've got, like say, a youth apprenticeship coordinator. They've got, they've got these layers of management that cause that to have a relationship where it's not the teacher that can make that happen. It's the managing portion of that that can make it happen, which is a really sad way to say that they're not doing their job. So there's a communication problem there. Um, their youth apprenticeship program run through that same management system. What I'd recommend is if you do have, you know, that placement, I don't know if you've used the Washington County youth apprenticeship program at all, but they definitely can serve or find somebody that can fit your, your job description better than really reaching out to each individual school. And cause they do all the work for you. And that, that's part of a, a state program too. So you can get maybe somebody that's eligible at even 16 years old that can fulfill your, your area of need and then maybe even employ them as a internship after, uh, you know, even as a secondary worker to keep them in the business. Um, I'm not saying that's the best solution, but it might be something that helps out. Otherwise, give me a call. I'll bring some people over your way. I'm, uh, I'm, I pretty much look at our youth apprenticeship program as being a, a series of, you know, helpers. They get a little money. They get a lot of money, actually, kickback, where I'd rather get you a co-op student or somebody that's willing to go there instead of being placed there. So definitely uh, give me a call. My email is going to be on the uh, PDF that Pat sends out. I'm more than willing to help you out and then get you some uh, talk to my cohorts in, uh, in Hartford and Slinger. I know them all pretty well. I don't know why they haven't responded to you. So I think most of the time it's programming. A little burnt out too, and depending on how it is. But I guess I'm the... Well, at one point in time, when my business was located in Waukesha County, we participated with the WCTC telecommunications program, and I would take co-op students from there on a regular basis, and the co-op structure was uh, they had to get a passing grade from me to pass the degree, and I... You, know, you get a mixed bag of candidates sometimes, but I had a lot of success with that program. Um, but not being in uh, uh, Waukesha County anymore, it's more difficult for me to get that connection. But that was quite successful in its time. Yeah, I, again, that's going to that tech ed level school that is a you know that co-op is a class that has to be passed they're paying money for it so that was up to you and that you know that really instills that work ethic you usually get a little bit better you know individual or somebody that's at least has a little bit more knowledge and a little bit more skill set could be the wrong skill set so they that's another thing like you had mentioned you know if you can get them early enough and kind of turn them into your type of worker or get your, you know, your claws into them as much as you want, I find that to be a lot more beneficial. And a lot of these kids that are seniors now at any one of their high schools can enter a co-op program and leave by midday to come and work for any industry th from midday beyond wherever you'd want to work with them. So definitely you know, give me a heads up. I'm, I've got a lot of resources that can help you out and definitely want to see uh, that flourish for you. 
Thank you for taking my questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dave. Okay, uh, we're kind of late here, so let's take one more question in the room and then see if we have one more question in Zoom. I envision from our perspectives that math is a tool for technology, science, and engineering. Uh, what clubs do you have that relate at the high school? Do you have, say, similar to the robotics club that generates an interest in technology and <clears throat> engineering and science where they develop a curiosity to go a little further or a little bit deeper into some aspect of that club activity, whatever. So I'm looking for what are the clubs you have that motivate the kids? <laughs> yeah, so, it, and again, it's gonna be based on each individual school or area that of interest, you know, between Grafton, Cedarburg, or Washington, we're all kind of associated with similar types of clubs. You know, there's first robotics, there's, you know, it depends on the club. Like right now I'm doing a Tequity club for girl technology, where basically we have, we build a motorcycle. That was one thing that was on there. Um, it's a big photo competition against all uh, about 12 other schools in the Milwaukee area. Um, club themselves, if it's associated, it's usually like the Weva, the high mileage vehicle. Skills USA is also, it's not a club per se. Um, it's more of an association. Okay. But it gets those kids interested in to those technical aspects and it makes them pursue. Not, it might not even be their interest, but all of a sudden they get a little spark and it's like something that they want to give a try to. So truly, there's those things that are available. Then we also, on top of the clubs, we have, like at Cedarburg, we have resource time where it's an enrichment program where these kids can come in. And right now we're, we built two things. We built the bar stool racer and a shopping cart racer. So those are two things that just our kids can come in and start working on it. We've got, I mean, talk about the math and the science doing, you know, controlled steering mechanisms and having to build that and put it on a shopping cart, that goes beyond the norm of, you know, cart racing, anything like that, which we don't have a club per se, but we can definitely get into and jump in with Grafton or Port Washington and their Formula Race team because of the associations that we've had. So there's these other things and in interests. We have, we have a, uh, a drone club for avionics and RC programming. We, you know, it really depends on who wants to take the initiative as the teacher more than anything, because really our clubs are based on the interest of the student. So I did the tech ed or the tech equity club because I had females that were interested in being able to ride and maintain motorcycles. Well, I knew that there was this competition out there and there's actually a level of AMA racing that's strictly for women and that they can get into that association as early as 18 years old. So that's what our steps are to get there. So if that helps with that. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have any questions in the Zoom audience? We've got time for one more question. You need to unmute if you wanna talk. Okay. Well, I do, if nobody else does. Okay, um, Peter, go ahead. What is your take on the last few years in the U.S. about the mass job exodus? What's causing that? The, in education or just in jobs in general? Uh, just, job, you know, people leaving their jobs, you know. Is it a, not a perfect match and they finally realize it's time to go home and stay with their parents or, <laughs> or whatever? You know, uh, it is so I had this conversation with a with um uh well, I'm trying to think of what their official title was. They basically were um associated 
with one of the larger companies in in, a, in Washington County. I won't put any names in there, but they basically he was personnel director comes to uh, basically wants to come and talk with us about how to get kids involved in and again with youth apprenticeship. And he basically said between the years, the students slash adults between the ages of 18 to 26 basically don't have the ability to hang on to something permanent because they've never had to do that before. So, and on top of it, normally at that point, usually you're only in like a training role or a level one type, you know, junior, whatever, and they're not making the money they thought they would be. So this guy straight up said, I can't hold anybody under 26 in our, our work area because ethically they all have to lift over 80 pounds. And we're talking about a place that has a lot of huge material movement, and things like that. And they were paying them probably in the range of between an 18 to $25 an hour position. So what they would say is I can go and work at, you know, XYZ, you know, department store for 15 to $18 and do nothing. And unfortunately, half that battle is that work ethic, is instilling that ability to say, hang out of that job. You might take one more year to get you to that next level, but you're gonna have to sit at this level for that year. You have to develop your skills to get to that next level. And it's gonna take, you know, you know, they're always, I'm telling you, what is it, what's in it for me? That's that society, what's in it for me? And what they're looking for is the dollar value. And, you know, Fortunate, unfortunate, we are paying these kids probably above average wage for minimal average worker. And that's where we're getting stuck. And that's what's killing our industry, I think. And I, I see it firsthand. It is ridiculous how little effort these kids are putting into it, where you're, I actually do more work setting the job up than having them do the work for me. And that's, that's the sad case, unfortunately. So I'm not saying that's everybody. You get some really strong kids and you cherish those kids and you hope that they really are, you know, the right person to push out there. But I, you know, I said before, there's a good majority of that population that won't want that unless you give them something more. So that answered your question. Okay, thank you, Doug. Well, let's hold the questions right there. Uh, I will post <clears throat> Doug's contact information on the reflector tomorrow, and then uh, we will get a copy of the video of this presentation up on our YouTube channel, and we'll put the link on the reflector, and then uh, we'll probably get something in the newsletter uh, with some, some additional information and repeat the contact information and some of the links and such from the presentation tonight. And uh, so I want to thank you, Doug, for coming tonight and talking with us. Do appreciate it. And and the Zoom audience audience is silently applauding. <laughs> right. They appreciate it too. Right. So, okay. You know, getting applause from an audience is well beyond what I ever did at school. <laughs> it's usually like straight out the door, and, and you know, I, I don't even get a buy sometimes. It's just okay. like. Go. So, okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks very much.